one. All right, we are live. And we have Scott Miller today from Block Settle. How are you today, Scott? Hi, Sonny. Everything's good. Happy to be here. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so uh, maybe before we start today, uh, why don't we just uh, maybe let people know where, how we initially met. So I, if I'm not mistaken, Scott, we, our paths crossed many years ago, right? Like we, we met, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, like 2012, maybe 2013 timeframe. Correct. So, so I'm just trying to remember at that time, I was working for a company called Buttercoin, which just seems like uh, a couple of lifetimes ago. But, um, but yeah, and I'm just trying to recall at, at that time, where were you? What were you up to? And then maybe before we or once you answer that question or later on, if you want to answer that, um, you know, I like to start with, you know, kind of like what's your story before the Bitcoin, crypto, all this stuff came into your life. What were you up to? Where, where, where in the world are you approximately? <laughs> um, yeah, let's maybe get started there. Okay, perfect. So um, after university, I believe it was about 2004, 2005. Um, moved to London from Sweden, started trading, uh, started trading interest rate derivatives. Uh, did that for a number of years in London. Then uh, my um, uh, wife became pregnant and obviously moved, wanted to move back to Sweden. And she's a GP here, so um, uh, it's not easy to port the license. So I ended up back in Sweden again. And I set, set up my own trading shop in about 2008, I believe. Uh, and did that for about four years. And um, uh, one of the things while you're trading, you get to read a lot, study the markets, follow what's like basically going on and having a bit of a interest in everything about monetary like functionings, etc. cetera. Um, I, I read this article about, um, uh, written by, I think, Richard Falkwinge. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, he wrote about what a scandal it was that the Pirate Bay case uh, wasn't, uh, uh, that the Supreme Court didn't allow the appeal mm. so that they wouldn't hear the case. Uh, and within a banner on the side, there was this Bitcoin uh, uh, logo where it says digital cash. So I obviously started reading up on it. And uh, I, I think from there, uh, I started off down the rabbit hole of Bitcoin and it what, 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 what year did you say or sorry what month did you kind of kind of come across this this fuck i think this was early 2012 early 2012 wow okay so, so okay. i think the price of bitcoin was around i don't know five dollars and the trend and shavers pirate at 40 was running wild in the bitcoin talk forum and the, hmm yeah, no, I definitely, I, I remember those days. And then like, who were the, who were the YouTube celebrities back then? He was definitely one of them, Rick. I remember he would kind of, you know, be one of the uh, kind of standing voices, uh, you know, advocating for Bitcoin. I remember Max Kaiser, he, he was definitely speaking about it back then. Guys, I remember like Eric Voorhees and, and you know, Roger Ver back in the day was yeah. a big Bitcoin uh, advocate. Voorhees was big, uh, especially mm -hmm. when he came Voorhees. out with Hoshi Dice uh, yeah. and uh, uh, there's a lot of should I say on-chain transactions due to it, mm. which I think didn't scale too well in the end. But um, uh, <laughs> the, the the whole provable uh, uh, provable gambling uh, was a very big step that I think he proved with Satoshi Dice, which hadn't been done before. Yes, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah, I do remember that. So, so I guess then maybe just explain then when you and I had met, I was working for a company based out of Silicon Valley. We were essentially launching white label, uh, kind of a white label exchange, Bitcoin exchange solution. And, and I believe you were, you were somebody that, you know, we were talking to, right, about you were interested in what we were, had to offer. So I'm just curious, like, how did, how did you get to that point where you were thinking about, hey, I want to really help bridge this, uh, this Bitcoin fiat ramp? Yeah, well, going back to the trading side, since I'd spent a, a number of years trading and effectively seen the, shall I say, the futures markets become electronic, everything from well, I unfortunately missed the first few years after um, the, the pits closed when markets were very inefficient uh, just after the, um, uh, everyone moved out from the pits. Uh, but we did a lot of trading, algorithm trading, etc. built lots of bots, especially traded between Canada and the US, it became uh, fairly large within that market. And uh, as Bitcoin came along, uh, um, we started looking at this uh, and saw the potential and we were trying to find a matching engine so that we can build 
uh, one of the first exchanges. And uh, so, so looking through all the different matching engines, it, it was a, should I say, a very difficult task finding any open source of alternatives or anything else out there. Uh, and I think you know, reading all the posts, uh, Reddit, Bitcoin talk, I think Buttercoin had a bit of traction with, with two or three different exchanges and you had a white label solution. So, so that's when we reached out and initiated the dialogue. And, and Scott, just, just, just for like, you know, maybe <clears throat> a lot of <clears throat> newcomers sakes, do you remember back in those days, if you had a bit of Bitcoin uh, and you needed to hold it, how would you go about doing it? Like, what were the different platforms that were available? Because I, I don't, I don't, I mean, if I'm not mistaken, I don't think the Trezors and the Ledgers, um, you know, and all these uh, hardware wallets were yet available. So do you remember this or no? <laughs> I think this was back when Mike Hearn wrote Bitcoin J. So, so there were a few, um, should we say, online web wallets. I think Bitcoin, um, uh, no, Blockchain Info, is it? Uh-huh, uh-huh. It was one of the big uh, wallets. And, uh, uh, well, uh, since they were, um, should we say, custodial, uh, we didn't use them. Uh, so we had uh, effectively two choices or three choices. Either there's Bitcoin Core, there's Armory, or there's Electrum. And um, uh, well, uh, let me just, get back. Just, just to pause there, blockchain.com, at least the way they position it is not that it's custodial, right? Like just, I mean, in the sense that they do claim you hold your own private keys. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, and so uh, just, but, but whereas like Armory and these other kind of platforms you mentioned like QT and all that, or, or Bitcoin T is, is, a, is a little bit different, right? In the sense that uh, at the time, I remember, I, like I, 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 even, I was going to show it, but I had a bunch of like these old laptops that you'd have to buy kind of, you know, make sure you never touch the internet. And, but, uh, but yeah, but when you mean, like, so you want to maybe just explain that a little bit in terms of like, because like, that, that's, that's what I was going at with all this is Armory. Like, like that was the, that was kind of my like go-to solution. And, oh. mm -hmm. Well, uh, Armory was, um, um, it places a bit of a requirement on the user because you need the whole Bitcoin core uh, synced locally. And then you need to run the Armory uh, database instance next to the uh, Bitcoin core uh, database on the same computer. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Wallet. So there was a rather large requirement on the user to be able to run this. But as a wrap around Bitcoin Core, it, it added a lot of functionality, which Bitcoin Core didn't necessarily offer out of the box, uh, specifically uh, uh, backup seeds and uh, uh, lock boxes and uh, uh, watching only wallets, offline signing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yep, I remember all of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so all of this made it the natural go-to default wallet, basically. Um, and back then, um, since the, the Bitcoin blockchain wasn't 300 gigabytes, it was probably around 20, 30 gigabytes. It, it, it didn't place that much of a requirement as you have today. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So no, I was just interested in, in that uh, because I guess that that'll maybe dovetail into the rest of our story. Um, but but anything else on on kind of your background? I mean, but if you had to sum it up, like, are you so you? It sounds like you had trading experience. So you're more like a finance, would you say, type of guy? Finance meets entrepreneur uh, type of background. Correct. Correct. So the continuation of that journey was uh, well, well, we never ended up doing business with Buster Coin, but we started. Not many people are aware of this, but Sweden is actually one of the centers of um, uh, financial technology like globally. Uh, we, we had a company called uh, OMX, which was purchased by NASDAQ. So NASDAQ actually uh, uh, builds and uh, uh, hosts, operates white label uh, exchange solutions for, I think, 80 or 90 exchanges globally. Uh, and when NASDAQ bought uh, OMX, uh, a few of the people from OMX left and uh, founded a company called Sinober, which also builds matching engines as well as uh, clearing engines. Uh, and having two such companies in Sweden, whereas most of the big exchanges build everything uh, proprietary, uh, is quite unique. So, so what happened in the end was we raised a bit of money from um, uh, Swedish and external or uh, foreign VCs or enough money to give a, a go to um, try to build a proper exchange, which would be uh, a lot more networked in that you could have many clearing members connect in. 
Uh, and I think as we were implementing this, there was a lot of, uh, we, we built the matching engine quite quickly. But as we started to dig into the details around the clearing system and all the settlement flows and who custodies the keys and et cetera, et cetera, there is a lot of difference of opinion, which made the timelines extend a lot. Uh, and eventually we, they pivoted into another idea around the FX market instead. And at that point, uh, we agreed to disagree because, I mean, obviously Bitcoin crypto was my focus. Um, so I was let out and allowed to um, pursue this other project. So, so within that uh, period of time, uh, the Armory people, uh, Alan Rayner, uh, his company uh, folded, ran out of funding basically. Uh, and the lead I say, system developer architect of Armory uh, is someone who I got to know through Alan Rayner. Uh, and we sat down and discussed like what, what should Bitcoin look like? What should the settlement models look like? I mean, to be true to the premise of Bitcoin, because I mean, back then you had all these problems with all these exchanges, like it wasn't that long after Mt. Gox and there's I mean, incalculable other, uh, shall we say, um, uh, issues with having centralized custodians over your uh, Bitcoins. So uh, a bit, getting back to the whole premise about why I came into this space, so if you look at how the financial system is built, uh, every financial institution is basically a, a, a keeper of records. They don't do anything else other than uh, keep records, a record keeping institution. So with, with Bitcoin, it's the first time that you as the account holder uh, control your own asset. You don't have to go to a keeper of records and asking them, to move your assets. Uh, and with this, having the, shall we say, granularity of the hierarchy come down to the account level, it, it just upends everything. Uh, and being early out in that space, and especially focusing on the settlement models, um, uh, that's where all the, shall we say, magic happens. It's not so much on the trading side, et cetera. It's actually building these new settlement models that become available as the account holder now can control their own keys or, or accounts, uh, as opposed to having a record keeping an institution. Yes, holy, I love like poetry. Uh, so, yeah. so if we, so if we just kind of sum up or back up a bit, right? So there's, there's this armory story going on. Uh, they're essentially building, you know, in my eyes, at least at the time, the best. Uh, you know, kind of framework, software framework for people to own their own kind of sovereignty, their own Bitcoin, not have to depend on others, um, you know, and things got difficult for them. For you, you were coming at this more from like a traditional financial lens, obviously bit by the Bitcoin bug, but looking at how, how to bridge fiat with crypto. And then you guys come together and, and realize that, you know, that centralized exchanges are honeypots, they will continue to get hacked unless something fundamentally different happens. Um, and then, okay, so then I guess, yeah, curious. So then what, everything that's going on now and the project you're involved in now, what, what was the, the genesis of that? And like, what did that look like in terms of like, yeah, like we just wake up one morning or you guys chatting over a coffee or, or yeah. So we started, um, I mean, coming out of that project, uh, I was very like, Bitcoin focused. I was looking at lots of different models, etc. Uh, and there was one model in particular which um, uh, really appealed to me, which is but basically what's the premise of Bitcoin that you control your own keys. Uh, and in order to do so, you actually need fairly advanced wallet software to be able to uh, um, uh, execute settlements, uh, which are, shall we say, not just ordinary payments where you have the most simple GUI just pay to some address basically. Uh, so in order to affect all these settlement models, you need actual high quality uh, shall we say, infrastructure in order to be able to do so. Uh, and if you look at the stacks out there, it was really only Armory that was uh, up to the task. Uh, so, so after Armory folded, uh, the, the uh, lead architect of Armory and myself as well as a third individual, um, uh, Albert, uh, we set out to build a company called uh, Blocksettle, or the company we're now involved with. 
Uh, and I think initially we were too optimistic on the timelines in terms of how long it would take to implement this. We were expecting it to take maybe 18, 24 months, but it's been roughly uh, double that time. So we've, um, yeah. So you guys started in 2016, this project, Block Settle, and, right. and I guess you're four years in now. Yeah. And okay, I, I mean, I can I can feel that as an entrepreneur, you know, sometimes things take a, a bit longer, especially if you're going to try and build or rebuild or reimagine, you know, how Bitcoin fiat uh, settlement happens. Okay, so uh, so what so I guess what did that um yeah, I think let's let's talk a little bit about block settle though. Like, so what is it? I mean, if you had to just describe it to my mom or something in in, in words, like, or someone, or my dad. Actually, my mom and dad they know about Bitcoin. So how would we describe it to them? <laughs> well, effectively, it's um, uh, Armory has been in stealth development, shall we say, for uh, the, the whole period. So if you look at the uh, official repo, the the dev branch, uh, I mean, it's been it's, it's super busy for the past four years. Uh, so effectively, block settle has been wrapped around that code. So, so the block settle wallet is all, all the latest Armory code. Um, uh, so, so yeah, it's a very comprehensive wallet. And within that, so, wallet hey Scott, sorry, sorry to pause, Matt, but just one thing. So I know it's, it's just a bit confusing. I think to most people, in the sense that you said Armory ran into money and things didn't work out, but now you're saying it's open source. So I guess it's important to note that, you know, Armory was always open source, mm -hmm. right? And uh, and there was, I guess, what, like some sort of incorporation that was built that was also called Armory that kind of hel helped uh, move it along. But but then the code base kind of remained is what you're saying. And, and now is, is very mm -hmm. vibrant and people are building on it. Okay. The Armory code base was always open source, um, but the idea was to sell to institutional uh, consulting services to effectively build the cust uh, custody solutions for them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think w with that, they also went closed source a bit of the code in terms of all the key ceremonies uh, and that type of work. Uh, and since they didn't really land enough clients back then, since the institutional space hadn't really gotten into Bitcoin, there wasn't uh, much of a market for it. And having a big suit and lots of costs uh, with uh, impatient investors, et cetera, uh, it just became that they winded down instead. But, but all the open source co code was there. Uh, and that's mm -hmm. effectively what we've continued building on. on. So exciting. So, so that's awesome. Okay. Okay. So continue, continue. So just you, now you guys are looking at essentially, uh, well, if we go back to 2016, 2017, you're saying we've got this, you know, this, like, I already know what you want to call it, like a Ferrari, right. Um, in terms of like a Bitcoin security. Now let's marry that with somehow traditional fiat rails. So how does one even go about, you know, doing that? It seems like a, impossible task <laughs> in the way you're describing <laughs> just here, so what we set out to do uh, mm. was to build a, a, a non-custodial exchange so that we have the fiat on ramp but but the trading happens in real time between the participants uh, but where they don't need to trust the exchange with any coin I think that's such an important point. So like, do you want to say that same thing in another way? Because I think that is the central point of what we're talking about here. And I want to make sure it's a mouthful. And I think even for me as a Bitcoiner, it took me a while to get it. But let's maybe, yeah, let's dissect that a little bit. So, uh, but I, I mean, to me, it, it's, it equates freedom, <laughs> right? But, but what does that mean exactly? Uh, okay, so, so, so right now, I, I think there's probably about two different exchange models. So, so there's the centralized exchange model where they custody both the cash as well as your Bitcoin. And they need to do so in order to guarantee the fulfillment of settlement obligations. Uh, otherwise, they cannot guarantee the, uh, that the buyer of Bitcoin gets Bitcoin delivered and the seller of Bitcoin gets cash delivered. There's too many opportunities for fraud. So the other model, which has developed, is basically the, the BISC, the local Bitcoin, the HODL HODL, where you set up a multi-sig address uh, the seller of Bitcoin pays into this. The buyer of Bitcoin needs to do a cash transfer from his bank account to the seller's bank account. Uh, and once that's gone through, the uh, seller of Bitcoin uh, hopefully uh, reports in uh, so that the multi-sig address actually delivers the Bitcoin to the other side. Uh, and if not, there's the arbitrage or no, uh, arbitration, uh, which the third party, which holds the third key, can... Uh, take upon themselves. 
uh, this model has, I mean, is fantastic from a decentralized perspective, but not very good from a liquidity perspective. Uh, also, if you do so a few too many times, I think your bank will also start wondering what, what's going on uh, as large payments come in and go out from your account. Uh, so, yeah, it, it's really not a, shall we say, a... Um, exchange method that would be appreciated by regulators if you did to any uh, degree or amount. So, so what we've built is a third model, which is a hybrid between the two, where we only ca custody the cash, whereas the Bitcoins go directly from the buyer to the seller. Yeah, yeah, that, that sounds super magical and crazy. Awesome, okay. Okay, so you had this like insight, I guess, uh, you want to do something along those lines, but how do you actually make it happen now? I mean, you know, it sounds like really yeah. difficult. <laughs> yeah. Which is why it took four years. Yeah. But the, mo the model in itself is very, should we say, simple, but there's a lot uh, that goes into the model to make it secure uh, that requires a lot of work. Uh, so the whole block settle stack is uh, open source, everything that's client facing, the whole uh, uh, blockchain indexer, the blockchain um, DB, as well as the client software. But what's closed source is how we monitor the blockchain and um, everything else around that. But the way it's built up is um, you have two parties to a trade, uh, you and me, for example. If I'm the buyer, I need to pre-fund cash with block settle. Uh, th then as we trade, um, I send out a request for quotes to buy into the market. So it's not an order book driven market, it's a request for quote driven market. So when I send out an RFQ into the market, it's open for anyone in the market to respond to. So oh, okay, okay, sorry. That, that's okay. It's not an order book model. It's an RFQ model. So is it more analogous to like an OTC desk as opposed to let's say like a right. like an automated? Okay, okay. But 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 is there an aggregation of orders happening somewhere in the sense that like you're obviously matching orders at one point? No. Uh, the, the, correct. No, the, the, there's no aggregation. It, it's on a trade by trade basis. Mm. It, it, it's very much. If you look at how the FX market is built. Uh, th there's actually no uh, centralized order book for, shall we say, Euro USD. Uh, you actually send a request for quote to multiple banks. Yeah, to talk about that. I mean, like, you know what I mean? Like, okay, so you're right. Your FX markets, there is no order book. So how is price determined? Uh, well, you've got all these market makers or dealers. So basically OTC desk. So if you uh, look at how the FX market works, so, so if you're a corporate client of HSBC uh, and you ask what, what's the rate to exchange Swedish crowns to US dollars, they will quote you a price. Uh, and uh, normally if you're a customer of that bank, you don't really go shop around. But what happened was that uh, people started developing these multi-dealer platforms where you can ask 10, 20 different banks uh, so it's the, basically the same model here. Since everyone has access to the settlement infrastructure, which is Bitcoin, anyone can act as a dealer, basically. Whereas in FX, you have to be a bank because they're the only ones who have access to the settlement infrastructure. Uh, ah, okay, 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 okay. So what's next, Scott? Well, what, like, what, what do you want to? I know, I know, we're, we're going to be working up our way to a demo, but uh, before then, what, what more do we need to share about? you know, the project uh, before we do so? Uh, well, since the project is based around uh, managing the keys yourself, we've actually developed um, one more product other than the um, uh, Spot XBT, which is the real-time delivery between the participants. It's actually, uh, we can tokenize securities, uh, issue, uh, and these tokens can be traded against Bitcoin in coin join transactions. So you actually have delivery versus payment on chain between the buyer and the seller. Using the Bitcoin blockchain. Right. <laughs> Man, okay, okay. Uh, so what's next, Scott? Are we doing going into the demo or, oh, yeah. I mean, I mean that's, that's also a mouthful, but it's like, it's insane. Like if you think about what you just said, it's awesome, okay. Yeah. Let, let, let's go into the demo. Yeah, 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 let's do that. I love demos, okay. Okay. Uh, 
You are, can you share screen from your side? Uh, just a sec. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you, everything clear? Crystal. Okay, so this is the block settle terminal. It's a uh, it's a uh, pure wallet with uh, built-in trading functionality. Uh, there's no need to run any, yeah, you don't need to create an account or anything. You can use it purely as a wallet if you so desire. It's a, should I say, very versatile wallet. It, it can um, load any hardware wallet or Trezor Ledger, uh, imports the wallets as a watching only wallet so that you can always keep track of what's going on with your Trezor and Ledger. You can run your own blockchain indexer, so um, uh, you don't need to rely on any third parties to actually see what's going on with your balances, nor do you need to share your pub key with any central server if you don't want. Uh, you can have multiple wallets. Uh, there's a uh, there's an explorer built in. You can see the transaction history, double click, uh, shows you all the details of the transactions. Uh, uh, there's charting, there's an OTC chat. We can get all, into all that later. Generate addresses, send Bitcoins, uh, everything from coin control so that you can determine exactly what input to use. So, yeah, it, it's a rather comprehensive wallet. So, Scott, I'm just going to just, just kind of, I mean, explain again what's happening here. So, I'm essentially using this terminal able to hold my own Bitcoin on my Trezor or whatever hard cold card or whatever wallet I'm using. And I'm able to make a trade with somebody I don't know on the other side of the world, potentially, we're able to trade from essentially uh, my Bitcoin to let's say his or her fiat, uh, like bank to bank and do this in a way where I'm not giving up custody at any point, right, of my keys. I'm not, I'm not giving my Bitcoin over to some fill in the blank centralized exchange and hoping that they don't get, you know, that something bad doesn't happen during that time, correct? Correct. Okay, and then and then if I dig a bit deeper in the overview screen here, what can you, can you just just explain again? So what so what what's the one thing that people are looking at or so that I see here XBT CAD that's the XBT Euro and these are like essentially the numbers are they being pulled from this like list of RFQs that are out there, mm. or how is it, how are these numbers being generated here? Very good questions. So here when you're uh, logged in. We send out the real-time streaming data of where the market currently trades, uh, and this data is purely indicative. These prices aren't executable. So, so these are purely market data points indicating where the market is right Got now. You. The, uh, Got you. Products. Uh, can you explain where that's coming from, though? Like, is that just like an aggregation of lots of exchanges and some... Right company like crypto compare or whatever that's like kind of aggregating it okay 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 got it so then and then okay then what's the next step here we're actually using bitcoin average for these prices bitcoin average got you okay okay uh yeah up here you see the private market which is our tokenized security is just a test security against bitcoin uh, and since we have bitcoin trading against three different currency pairs we can trade those currencies against each other as well uh, down here in the non-settled transaction section, we see any Bitcoin transaction with less than six blockchain confirmations, uh, just so that you know what's uh, unsettled within your wallet. So you can double click and look at all the transaction details. Uh, up here, you see your portfolio valuation uh, and the aggregate value in Bitcoin. Uh, let's head to the trade page. That's where the trading happens. So the trade page is built basically the same as the market data page in the overview. Uh, you click on any of the market uh, or instruments uh, and you're able to um, f formulate a responsive pro or formulate an RFQ which you can submit to the market which uh, anyone can respond to. Uh, so, so let's sell 0 0.1 Bitcoin for instance. We send the RFQ to the market. We have a responsive quote. So the way the RFQ market works is uh, you send a RFQ to the, uh, to the trading network basically, and there's a 30 second uh, competitive bidding period. 
during which anyone can uh, submit or improve or pull their quotes. And at the end of the period, the, your match with the dealer that provides the best response and quote to you. Wait, so that, wait, 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 when you're doing that though, isn't that kind of like, like when you're finding the best quote, isn't that kind of analogous to like order matching to some extent or what am I missing here? No, 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 you have it, some it, algorithm. No? So, so imagine you send this out to 10 or 20 OTC desks and whoever prices you the best gets the trade. Mm. Uh, and then once you're matched, uh, you have all these details. Wait, there's not enough time now to. Let me do that again. Sorry. Okay. So imagine this is being sent out to 20 dealers out there. Uh, right. They all come back with responsive quotes. And at the end of the uh, quotation period, it moves to settlement or settlement execution. And you have 30 seconds to sign the uh, transaction. Got it. So the order accept is actually the settlement execution of the on-chain transaction. Mm -hmm. So if you want to, if you'd like to see a few more details, you can go through all the trade details here, see the pricing, uh, the exact details of the transaction, etc. So let's sign this. And it's on chain. Here's your transaction. So what happened here is we sold 0 0.1 Bitcoin. Uh, so the way it works is that when I sell it to you, uh, we set up or each participant must have an address, uh, address registered with the service. So we take this address and uh, we actually do uh, ECDH multiplication with the settlement ID uh, and create a one of two settlement address between the two parties to the trade. Uh, th this means that each settlement address is unique uh, and can't be mapped back to the two users so that there cannot be any on-chain analysis of trading patterns. Um, Interesting. Okay, wait, so hold on. I just, uh, what did you say? I just bought 0 0.1 Bitcoins or I, I just sold 0 0.1. I just, it was a sell order. Right? I sold. So, so you sold. So that means you're now expecting that equivalent amount of dollars, right, into your Correct. into your bank account. So, how, okay. So has that occurred, or can you confirm? Uh, well, it will. Or I mean, like, how do you do that? Or is that something that yeah is parallel to this? Uh, well, here? since everything is pre-funded, I don't know if you're seeing the correct screen here. I can see the trade screen right now. Uh, just let me log into the clearing system. If you look at the Block Settle web page, uh, there's a test page where you can uh, log into the clearing system. And within that, it works very much like um, any other exchange out there. We, we see the cash balances down here. Uh, uh -huh. So we have those cash balances in the clearing systems. So they will be reserved in the clearing system. And at the end of six confirmations, the balance will be transferred from the uh, buyer to the seller. Got it, got it. Interesting. Interesting. So, I mean, just to like kind of tie up that that piece here so, th so essentially there is a bank involved right that that kind of enables that fiat transfer at the end of the day correct that you guys have partnered with or work with i mean we don't need to go into details about that bank but i'm just curious so there is some sort of like fiat element to this and yeah, uh, this works just like any other centralized exchange in terms of the fiat leg so everyone needs to pre-deposit money prior to trading uh, so we're a regulated payment service provider here in Sweden. Mm. We have a client's account into which uh, funds are deposited. Uh, everything's kept there uh, completely separate from all corporate funds and uh, 
uh, it's held on an aggregated and commingled basis, all the clients' funds, uh, and we keep track of the disposition of the accounts uh, within our clearing system. Gotcha, gotcha. So, so exactly. So I just want to make sure that this isn't something like just like Armory, where people are holding their own wallets. Like there's actually this fully kind of you know circular uh, system here where you can truly get your Bitcoin in and out of fiat using your bank account, not like a cash transaction down the, you know, with a sketchy guy down uh, the street or something. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, so, so let me show you this from the dealing side as well, because the way it works, when you submit from one terminal RFQ to the market, anyone else who has a terminal, I mean, globally uh, and is connected is able to provide responsive quote trading interest. And it's also possible to write scripts, et cetera, around this so that they can formulate responsive quotes programmatically, uh, which is what we had when we sent the response, when we sent the um, RFQ. So uh, if you move to the dealing tab, uh, let me from. So here, someone has sent a RFQ to the market that they would like to sell 0.15 Bitcoins for euros. Uh, so, so let's provide a responsive quote. So the quoted price. And it works exactly the same way. You can automate the signing process as well. Uh, I mean, this means that anyone basically who has a terminal is free to provide uh, quotes to any trading interest that comes in. And here's the transaction where you bought. Does that make sense? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So, I mean, like this, you know, the whole thing people talk about, like be your own bank and, and Bitcoin kind of solves for half of it, I guess you could say, right? Because you, you can hold your asset yourself and not have to deal with anyone else. So you, you guys are kind of solving the other half of it, which is, well, okay, you can be your own bank, but if you need to like get into some other fiat currency, how do you do that um, without having to risk all your Bitcoin, right? So you can now do that uh, in a way where, you truly are your own bank where you're holding your own, you know, your own private keys on your own desktop and, or not even your desktop, sorry, on your own treasure. And you're able to interact with a global set of, you know, traders, dealers, brokers, OTC desks, whatever people that have this terminal essentially. Um, and that's, yeah, I think that's pretty awesome. Okay. So what's next here, Scott, in terms of the demo, was there some other things? I know you showed me some, just let me show you the private market as well. So, so, so let's try and sell uh, yeah. th three tokens uh, and I'll just show you the coin joint trans transaction. Um, so, so, so the private market is, um, uh, here in Sweden, the legal framework is very permissive actually. So, so we're able to set up SPVs here in Sweden uh, and the SPV will hold whichever underlying asset uh, within it that yeah, uh, you can yeah, an SPV is just a special purpose vehicle, right? It's like a, uh, a company essentially or incorporation or what is? Exactly. So one would incorporate a, uh, uh, a company here in Sweden and, and the company here in Sweden can hold um, yeah, any underlying asset basically. Uh, and the SPV itself would be tokenized the entire share registry of the SPV. And so the SPV would be traded uh, against Bitcoin in a delivery versus payment fashion. I mean, it's a very, very big change to the financial system. Because if you look at how the financial system works right now, it's all built on these uh, keepers of record, basically. So if you want to buy shares, you don't actually hold your shares. You have them in some uh, depository, uh, whereas the payment goes through uh, yeah, a clearinghouse from your bank through the clearinghouse to the seller's bank, basically. Uh, and this is, to my knowledge, one of the first times you actually have delivery versus payment uh, in real time, where the actual delivery of the assets 
and the payment of the asset is uh, atomic between the buyer and seller. So, you know, this whole hype about STOs, like security token offerings, and people talk about it quite a bit. Um, so are you saying that this, you guys are like, just kind of as a side note, also not only solving this like Bitcoin to fiat problem, but also potentially maybe taking stabs at, at solving this, uh, you putting securities on the blockchain and, and kind of set, solving for the whole settlement risk as well? Yeah, correct. Absolutely correct. So, so I mean, the, the first security we're actually tokenized is, um, uh, our own share because you know, we don't have much else to uh, put out there until uh, other people come and want to list on our exchange but if you look mm. at how things have developed uh, i think many of the utility coins that were developed are actually securities uh, in disguise uh, where they were actually l looking for the um, uh, yeah looking to become securities or masquerading as utility coins if you will uh, the bitcoin blockchain i, I don't think uh, will have the capacity to manage a lot of trades, but um, if you have private limited companies and just some trades, uh, it should be fine. But scaling wise, uh, I think uh, yeah, different type of scaling solutions will be needed uh, for it to be possible to have delivery versus payment in, in any scale on chain. Does Lightning and things like that actually address this issue or is that, that, that that's a very good point uh, lightning is amazing for retail payments but uh, looking at lightning i haven't really understood it to be very good at shall we say delivery versus payment and securities issuance mm -hmm. etc in, in this regard i would say uh, block blockstream's uh, liquid network is actually very good yeah yeah awesome i'm a, actually uh unicorn was a, a one of the early adopters of liquid, a big fan of Adam, those guys. Um, okay, so what's what's next here then in terms of these tabs up top as well? Are there some other ones you wanted to share? Uh, well, uh, I mean, uh, I, one, one of or the challenges that we of have it? is that there, it, it, there's so many things going on with the term. I think people really need to play around with it themselves to figure things out. So, so what on that point is that possible? Is it live? I mean, now? Can people live. Go in? I mean, we're super happy to have feedback. I mean, if people want to come in and help develop, etc. I mean, we're very, very happy. Uh, help us find bugs. Uh, this model is very new. Uh, it hasn't really. So, when did you guys go live? Like officially, I guess. When was the, uh, the day? I would say about three months ago. That's three when everything ago. was uh, available to download and test. We haven't really pushed anything hard yet. So, so it's basically just a soft launch for now uh, until possibly beginning of next year or end of this year. I mean, for, for us, the most important part is to be, uh, to have longevity, basically. We've been doing this for four years. We want to give it at least another four or five years. Uh, but yeah. And so what are your guys' goals right now in terms of, so you've done this soft launch. Are you just looking for kind of power users to start playing around with it and giving you guys some feedback? Um, like, are you in that process where you're just trying to, you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, like, what, what are you trying to accomplish in like the next, let's say, three months or so? There's a few things. We'd very much like to get listed with Bitcoin.org so, so that the wallet gets some form of official recognition. To, to do so, we obviously need to have people review it and feedback, etc. see if there are any bugs. Uh, I think having played around with it and traded a lot for the past four years, I think we've found uh, most, if not all of the wallet bugs. Uh, there may be some few small annoyances still on the trading side, but uh, uh, it's nothing that will affect any settlements. It's more of a UI aspect or... Um, and it's not like a mobile app, right? People need to obviously download this on their desktop. Um, and it is a terminal where they need, it's not like a website, right? They need to essentially download something. Uh, correct. And where do they get all that? No, yeah. It's, right. it's all on the Blocksettle webpage. Which is blocksettle.com, right? Correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then sorry, you were saying, so uh, it's like, it's like, and just to kind of explain that, you know, because a lot of things nowadays are just on Chrome or whatever. So um, just so people understand, they are downloading this software to their computer as well. And they would also simultaneously need some sort of 
um, like Trezor or, or, you know, some sort of hardware wallet? Or is there also the mechanism built in where, I mean, it's obviously not advised that they hold their keys on their computer because it might not be the safest place. But like, how, how do people, um, you know, actually preserve their kind of their keys? Uh... Well, the, the, the wallet has its own software wallet, uh, which is mm. a very good software wallet. Mm. It's actually the terminal setup. I mean, let's not go into that now, but there's actually a, a signer um, running in the background, which you can run on different computers. So you can have remote signing and offline signing and all of these other um, exotic setups, if you will. So the software wallet works very nicely and it has a number of advanced features, which I think hardware wallets uh, are lacking to some degree. But then just to make it easy and yeah, because most people nowadays use hardware wallets. So for us to add this to make it uh, hardware wallets plug and playable uh, was an easy decision to make. So anyone with a hardware wallet can just plug their Trezor or Ledger in, uh, import the uh, XPub and uh, generate all the uh, the leaves. W one of the benefits uh, of this, uh, the, the way Blockset Terminal has been structured, is that you actually get to uh, to see all the different um, address types. So you can choose what address type you want to generate, and uh, you can send from either legacy, uh, native, or nested. You don't need to be married to one, uh, shall we say, derivation chain, if you will. Uh, and you can hold multiple wallets. So if you have a Trezor with password settings so that you have multiple wallets within your Trezor, you can have all of them as watching only wallets, uh, as well as host your own blockchain indexer. So, so you don't have any privacy leaks at all. Interesting. And you guys are, uh, I mean, it's obviously a Bitcoin only solution, right? Like that should be clear as well, because now there's so much noise out there with so many different things. But this is like a, a pure hardcore Bitcoin solution, right? Correct. Bitcoin only, only. Love it. Love it. Okay. So, uh, so I guess getting feedback from like power users, getting listed on Bitcoin.org eventually, um, you know, uh, starting to kind of ramp up traction on that front. Uh, okay, anything else on, on the demo or on Funny. the kind of the block? Yeah. Oh, let me pause it. All right, we're back here. Uh, okay, awesome. So anything else you want to, I guess, wrap up on the on the block settle side of things in terms of the company, the project, the team, or things people can maybe expect or how they can learn more and get involved? Well, we hope to be around for a long time. Um... There's a lot of interesting things in our development pipeline. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, as you can see, we're very focused on getting things done on chain and correctly and through the premise of Bitcoin where everyone manages their own keys. So, so the, yeah, there's a lot of upcoming development which we hope to release in the near term, everything from making this a lot more available from an API standpoint so it doesn't be, become as plugged into the GUI so that people can write scripts, et cetera, uh, and interface the API directly. And play. All right, we're back again. Okay, so let's maybe shift gears. So if there's nothing else on, on the block settle side, so just again, I, I keep doing these little summaries just so that people can get a reset, right? So fundamentally what we're talking about is a solution that allows people to trade their Bitcoin without giving up custody and in a way where they're not, it's not just using cash, um, but in a way where they can actually settle fiat. Hey, Scott, are we, did we lose each other again? Mm. Zoom, what is going on? Uh, uh, should be back now. Maybe, my, maybe it's my internet. I can, I can edit some of this out if it's necessary afterwards. Okay, should we just keep keep going then, Scott? Uh, we got a little bit of time left, so so a couple of things that I wanted to touch on. Um, the next one, the next question I like to ask is, um, and, and again, I think just your project's existence maybe answers this question to some some extent for me. But you know, what is one you know belief that you hold to be true, uh, which most others in Bitcoin would maybe disagree with you on? Um, yeah, we could talk about custody or anything else you want. Oh, I, it's probably a difficult one. Uh, I think 
I, I think Bitcoin is the most beautiful thing ever built. I, I think um, many people might uh, underestimate how, um, uh, I mean, the whole scalability of it. it. It seems poised to become much more of a settlement network as opposed to a uh, retail payment network. Uh, I think Bitcoin needs to evolve with lots of different layers on top of it. So that Bitcoin is basically the base settlement layer, whereas you've got lightning, side chains, everything else built around it that can support all the high frequency settlements and payments. Whereas you can have net deferred settlement systems which settle up once a day or two uh, on the main chain. Um, that's where I see Bitcoin heading as opposed to being I mean, already today we've seen a, a big shift in terms of who holds Bitcoin from being very uh, centric around individuals who held much of the Bitcoins to much of it being held by large institutions, uh, often with custodians. Uh, so hopefully, uh, and that's probably one of the challenges we have as well, is getting our model out there and um, yeah, pre preaching that uh, people should come back to the premise of Bitcoin and custody their own keys and trade peer to peer and um, uh, hopefully this resonates with the community and um, yeah and, and Scott I mean like look the, right now I mean everybody is offering Bitcoin right I mean I think PayPal gives you Bitcoin right supposedly or uh, all these companies right cash app and so I, I I think for most people, and most people don't even care, right? But for those who do, um, like, what's the difference? Like, what are we talking about here versus, let's say, just logging on and buying some Bitcoin and not being able to take it out, right? Because I don't think the PayPal solution offers any of that. Like, what, what's the fundamental difference that we're talking about here, Block? Like, why would people want to go through some of these complexities and hardships to, to learn something like this versus, you know, the mainstream kind of, you know, going Bitcoin bonanza now? <laughs> well, I think it comes down to the Andreas phrase about uh, not your keys, not your coin. Um, and uh, hopefully that's something that resonates with people. And as opposed to having some uh, paper certificate claiming your own Bitcoin, that you want to manage the actual keys yourself, uh, as opposed to just having price exposure to the uh, volatility around the uh, fluctuations. And, you know, it, it's kind of like weird to me that, Scott, like even a lot of really wealthy people don't want to hold their keys and i find it a bit like frustrating um because they will literally say and people that are a little bit less tech savvy maybe a little bit less freedom oriented if you will um a lot of wealthy people are just like you know what just show me the insurance you know show me the the qualified custodian regulated and i will you know sign up but it's like wait hold on but you don't even need insurance if you're the one who's holding it. <laughs> you know, you can, it's kind of hard to explain to people, but why should people hold their own keys? You know, isn't it just easier to be like, oh, well, Lloyd's will cover their butt if something goes wrong. And you know what I mean? And versus like, I have to take responsibility myself. And well, there is no decentralized network unless you're able to hold your own keys. Mm. The whole underlying premise of Bitcoin gets blown up, basically. I mean, if you can't hold your own keys, I mean, why not hold it with Lloyds? I mean, but there you're subject to all, uh, all forms of other, um, shall we say, uh, rule changes, etc. I mean, it, it might be fine if you live in a first world country, but if you live somewhere else... Uh, mm. Mm. So this is much more, I guess you could say, like kind of in in line with uh, the Bitcoin ethos, the Bitcoin Satoshi's true vision, if you will. At least it sounds like to me. Um, okay, so so if we had to kind of sum up, then like you know the contrarian belief. I mean, from the block settle side, it seems like you know even to say hold your own keys is a bit of a contrarian belief nowadays. You know, it's like with all the different services that are coming out. And so, so yeah, so I think that's an important one. I think it's like an important message that people need to understand and kind of wrap their head around and yeah. And then kind of get back to the root of why Bitcoin is what it is. Uh, it seems like most people, you know, are kind of overlooking that they're just looking for that price hype, but there is no price hype if Bitcoin doesn't exist. So, 
so so very very excited that you guys are doing what you're doing and then and then and then this last question you can even pass on it if you want not last question but one of the last ones i'd like to ask before i go into a bit of tangents here is is the same question i asked prior but more as it applies to the world at large so like outside of looking outside of bitcoin um you know there's a lot of weirdness craziness in the world is there anything that you think that uh that you kind of i don't know believe to be true i mean sweden is an interesting place <laughs> globally speaking but yeah just curious uh, well, uh, difficult to say. Um, I, I mean, yeah. the, the financial system as it's run today in terms of the, the you know, monetary aspects, um, let, let's hope Bitcoin can be some form of safe haven. And uh, if governments get too, I should say, uh, uh, yeah, if they print too much money, uh, that Bitcoin sh shows that another way is possible. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, and once that happens, uh, and it, all of a sudden Bitcoin's the stable one, uh, uh, it would be a very interesting discussion, but uh, that's going to be many years in the making. But uh, the nice thing about Bitcoin is it's got staying power. It's got close to 100% uptime. It's always up, always works. And just by surviving it um, proves a point. And Scott, just, you know, I got to ask, so you've been in the Bitcoin scene for a long time. There is so much going on in this space outside of Bitcoin now, right? After Bitcoin, why are you so, you and your team so focused on Bitcoin and not on shit coins? <laughs> I mean, I don't mean to be mean, right? I'm just curious, like, well, why is it? Because I mean, again, I find like most of the noise out there is about, oh, you know, this coin pumped or that coin pumped or this or that, and then they die like a couple of days later. But curious, like well, what's helped you guys kind of stay on the straight and narrow? Well, like, as I said, we've been in this for the super long term, basically. Uh, we want to continue that direction. We're not looking for like pumping something and dumping it. Um, and I think yeah, many of these uh, altcoins, it's very difficult for them to have staying power. Uh, I mean, many times they're utility coins masquerading as uh, securities. Uh, and other times, if they try and become an actual chain themselves, much like Bitcoin, you've got the whole issue about the initial distribution of currency and uh, I mean, Bitcoin's been around for a long time. Uh, all the initial distribution has been done. It's been done fairly. It's not pre-mined to a few founders, etc. Uh, I mean, yeah, I, I think Bitcoin's the one. So, 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 so why stray? <laughs> Bitcoin's the one. Yes. Okay. I, I just got another question for you. So, um, as you know, I've been. I mean, since we met, right? We're eight years now. I've been uh, really kind of laser focused on the centralized exchange space, right? So curious to know, how do centralized exchanges, uh, you know, how do they, how do they, is there a way where they can operate with block settle work? Like, is there some sort of interoperability there where, you know, exchange owners like myself who are aware of some of the risks that, you know, our model pose? Um, yeah, yeah, I'm just curious, like, you know, we, we recently, I, you probably heard, but uh, we recently had a, a pretty interesting victory in the central, in the Supreme Court in India, where the central bank tried to, you know, prohibit all the banks from dealing with Bitcoin companies, um, all three judges ruled in our favor. Um, recently, Tim Draper invested in our company and million and a half users, lots of traction and, and, and you know, exciting times. Um, but these are the times where I think like, you know, it's important to like dig deep and, and continue solving like big problems, right? Not, uh, yeah, so, so just curious, is there, is there a way, I mean, to me, the, the, the obvious one seems like, well, if you've got an OTC desk of sorts and you might want to plug in to the block settle network if it's feasible within your country. Um, but yeah, but, but what may be some, some ways? First of all, I, I, I read that as well. Congratulations on the court victory. I know it was a long battle for you. Mm -hmm. Two or three years or... Mm -hmm. Two years, yeah. Getting back to the question around the centralized exchanges, I mean, we'd love to work with them if they're open to doing so. I mean, as I said, the next steps that we're developing is uh, to make our APIs, settlement APIs, less baked into the actual terminal so that anyone can interface with them. 
uh, one of the last tabs which I didn't show is an actual OTC tab so that you have a built-in chat uh, which has much of the uh, Bitcoin level security uh, in terms of encryption uh, and where people can trade peer-to-peer -peer as well. So, so if you're an OTC desk, there's hopefully business to pick up there once. Did you ever hear a bit message? Bit message. Is that maybe I'm maybe I'm mistaking it? But but your your <laughs> chat thing that you just talked about is it like a is yeah. it built off of Bitcoin anyway, or is it like it's something uh, totally it, independent? <laughs> it uses the encryption. Uh, it, bit message works very much like Bitcoin in terms of that the uh, the messages get sent via all, all the nodes, so every node gets every message. Uh, so it's very difficult to map like uh, you know, who the message was intended for if everyone gets every message. I see, I see. But okay, so anyway, so you guys have a an OTC chat platform. I saw, was there charts there as well yeah. or did I misread I it, that? It, it, correct. Okay. So, so there's a, yeah, in terms of centralized exchanges, would they be interested in our charts? I, I probably doubt it, but <laughs> in terms of the OTC desks of the centralized exchanges, I, I We'd be very happy to speak to them uh, to see if there's a business opportunity in terms of them uh, quoting prices. Nice, nice, love it, love it. Okay, okay. What else? What else, Scott? Okay, so I have, uh, I mean, I have a couple of the questions, but before I get to those, is there anything that you wish I would have asked that I haven't asked about Block Settle or your 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 project? I I think we yeah touched most of the points and probably gone a bit too deep into some of them too. <laughs> yeah, so hope, yeah. Hopefully people watching this aren't too confused. But um, No, no, no. It's all good. I've been trying to like break it down in my layman's uh, terms as much as I could. But uh, okay, okay. No, uh, that's awesome. Okay, so maybe let's just shift gears on a couple notes. If you still have a bit of, do you still have a bit of time? Uh, I think we had like the hour and a half, yeah. right? Okay, so do you have, okay, I'm just going to leave the question kind of open-ended, but uh ai <laughs> is that something you think about is it something you is you think it's more just like like a fluffy term that people throw around are you do you have concerns i don't know are you what's your what are your thoughts on like um artificial intelligence i think it's too soon to tell any viewpoint i have will be um uh, should i say uh, not well thought out enough uh, I mean, so so far, I have very little concerns in terms of the uh, having driving cars, etc. I actually look forward to it. In terms of robots taking over the world, I don't think <laughs> we're there so yet. <laughs> <laughs> it might be preferable to politics. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it comes from a smile at like how well, the status of the world is. And you know what the crazy thing is? Like before, um, before 2011, 2012, I, I had like all these complaints about the world, um, wh whether it be about money, whether it be about politics, whether it be about this or that. Um, but the beauty about Bitcoin is that once it came into my life, instead of me just complaining about things, I had something that I could like focus on and put my attention towards and not have to feel like defeated every day because they're like these massive like problems that you know nobody even talks about let alone addresses so so bitcoin really kind of goes right to the heart of it and and i get it you know a lot of the stuff we're talking about is super geeky and and most people probably won't even care or they don't have the time or the patience to even hear it but you know, some do, and those people now because of the internet can kind of, you know, get their brains together and now even, you know, Bitcoins and, oh, I love it, love it. Okay, another kind of, again, thorny question, just generally just curious to know people's perspectives on um, this notion of, and it kind of dovetails off of that last question a bit, but uh, universal basic income, that's something that a lot of people are talking about. And, you know, as a kind of a freedom lover, I have like very mixed feelings about it, but just curious, is that something that, you know, you've, you know, now with, I guess, like even with COVID, uh, a lot of, I know in Canada, a lot of people got something similar to it. Um, I know the, the next government is thinking about bringing it in. So these things both scare me and, you know, excite me a bit, but, but mostly scare me. So just curious to know what, what, what's your thought on it? <laughs> on a personal level, I don't know. I mean, Sweden is fairly far down the socialism path already, where government's close to half of GDP. So 
uh, I'd say our model is pretty close to the universal basic income as um, uh, yeah, there's no one homeless on the streets, etc. Um, so I think everyone has a basic subsistence here in Sweden. Does that come in the form of money? Like, does the government literally just give everybody like, I guess if you don't no, 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 have no, a no, job or no, like, because no. the idea of UB is everybody, even if you're like a multi gazillionaire, you get your five grand a month or whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious, is that kind of what Sweden's like, or you feel like it's maybe moving towards or? Uh, it's difficult to say. I think every election cycle, it's, it seems to be pointing a different direction. Well, one thing we do have is we actually have UBI in terms of children. So everyone under the age of 18 gets a monthly amount of yeah, just 150 bucks or so, mm. which the parents receive regardless of income of the parents uh, so that the children can be taken care of. And have you heard of GPT-3? Have you been following this like open AI thing that Elon mm. Musk, a lot of these guys, oh, it is insane, man. It's insane. Some of the things that's happening, like they have this one project where you just talk to it and it generates code. Now it's not going to replace people that can build like armory level or, you know, Tesla code or whatever, but, you know, pretty basic things, but it gives you an idea of like, like where at least some of this is going. Um, and, you know, and you brought up the car thing, right? Uh, yeah, like cars in the next few years may very well start driving themselves completely. Um, so how many people drive uh, for a living and, and what happens to those people? Are we going to tell them to become a programmer? And if so, you know, what about GPT-3? <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I don't know. I sometimes think about, you know, um, sometimes think about this stuff and, and it's like it's like it kind of makes your brain go like short circuit a bit because it's like you know you you want to make sure people are, are helped at the same time but you know uh, just like last week my, my parents came and visited they spent like a couple weeks here and um on their last day my mom was like talking about like how the canadian government is just like giving everyone money and and finally she asked the question she was like where does the government get all this money and i was like mom like that's that's it like that's the question that i was asking back in 2011 10 you know and that's what eventually led me to bitcoin and and it's like where does it come from and it all starts with that question right like where does it come from and I, if people don't even like ask uh they just kind of stop asking because I don't know. It's not cool to, but anyway, Scott, what else? I know I got a few minutes left of your time aside from, you know, blocksettle.com. Are there other places like, do you have, do you maintain Twitter or LinkedIn or anything like that? Like, is there where, where people can connect with you and if they want to hit you up, I don't know, like personally and, and get a demo, not a demo, but like, you know, I don't know if they want to just get involved in the ecosystem. How do they do about go about doing that? Uh, probably the easiest is to email us. I think our, so social media accounts, uh, I mean, we've been very much focused on code and, and development. Uh, we're not, shall we say, super savvy on the social media side. So I think that's something we're developing out as we speak. Uh, yeah, if you want to reach out, I mean, yeah. Is there a with, general email or something where they can hit you guys uh, up? Uh, hello at blocksapple.com. Nice, nice. So, okay. So that, or actually, if you go in, just log into the terminal in the OTC chat, there's always one of us around. There's a support channel in there. Uh, yeah, uh, just ping us. We're around. I mean, okay. super happy to help out. Anyone who wants a demo, very happy to go through all the steps. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, we're available for anyone to reach out. Awesome, Scott. So any anything else uh, that you want to cover? I mean, like I said, I, I, mean, I kind of went through most of it. We're almost at the end of our time. But yeah, if there's nothing else, you know, we can bring this to a close. And this was very, very exciting. I'm so happy we got to do the demo as well. I know we've been kind of thinking about this for a while. But yeah, really made, happy we made it happen. Uh, yeah, yeah, any parting words? <laughs> well, thank you very much, Sonny, for this opportunity. I know you've uh, got a big following within the space. And um, um, oh long career and very well regarded within the ecosystem so it's been an honor to be on your show man i'm, I'm pumped about this one i've been i've been interviewing a lot of my, my first kind of wave of people were like the max kaisers and the the like the like the naimi like the people who've been doing all the media outlets yeah. and my next kind of goal is to really focus on a lot of these entrepreneurs like yourselves especially that are doing 
I'm not religious, but like God's work. <laughs> and, uh, and I just feel like, you know, that no one, not enough people are, are talking about it. And there's just way too much. The SNR, the signal to noise ratio is not good uh, right now. I'm hoping to shift that in our favor, Scott. Okay, so we'll just maybe end it at that point. Um, if you guys, you know, want again in the next uh, month, week, year, whenever you guys are ready, you want to do another one and bring some of your team members on if that's something you're interested in uh yeah we were glad to do that and scott thanks again let's do that perfect sonny awesome pleasure all right cool i'm gonna bring it to an end here